If someone comes to our home, they better be carrying a big blaster. On I said, on your knees. Stay with me, Vice. Vice! What have they done to you? Company! Attention! Welcome back to part two of The Complete Life of Rex. Covering every canon event, with added context and discussion of their importance to the clone designated CT-7567. In part one, we saw the dual attack on Rex's dogma. His Jedi generals were less rigid and cold than his Kaminoan trainers had prepared him for. And somehow his clone brothers, though made from the same DNA and endlessly drilled with the same military ethic, had wildly different responses to the war, with Slick becoming a traitor and working against the Republic, and Cut walking away from the war entirely, claiming that his quiet life on a remote farm with his family brought him more meaning than fighting the Separatists. But things would only get more complicated and difficult for Rex from here on out, as evidence was gathering of a hidden evil that was manipulating the Clone Wars itself. So let's pick it up here in the year 21 BBY. Rex was troubled by his interactions with Cut on Seleucami, but these thoughts would have to be put aside for the time being, as a potential civil war was bubbling up on the world of Mandalore. While Kenobi is learning about this from the Duchess Satine, they are nearly killed by a Death Watch terrorist attack, and after they discovered a Death Watch base on the moon of Concordia, the Queen travels to Coruscant via her royal ship, the Coronet, with Anakin and the 501st arriving to provide extra security. Reporting for escort duty, General. Cody and Rex would stay with the Jedi Generals, while the men kept searching the ship for any CIS or Death Watch interference. And so just after hearing of a clone brother that left to form a family, Rex is in the elevator when it is revealed that Obi-Wan and Satine had a romantic past. Though of course he did keep his oath to the Order. So you're close to her? I knew her. One of the cargo boxes in the hold contained spider assassin probe droids, killing the 501st troopers Mixer and Red Eye. One would make its way to the Duchess's chambers, while the rest of the clones were engaged by another one. It would be revealed that the Duchess had a traitor in her court, while Rex was tackled by a spider droid that nearly tore into him, before Anakin was able to jump in and help him get the upper hand. B2 super battle droids would then storm the passageways, but Rex and the boys were able to keep them from taking over the ship, while Anakin would dispatch the traitor and prevent the rig's explosives from going off, allowing the Coronet to make it safely to Coruscant, where she was intent in keeping her planet out of this galactic war. Excuse the interruption, sir, but it is time to depart. General Fisto is expecting us. From here, they would leave Ahsoka to help with the Mandalorian Academy, an event that would help build a connection with Tano and the Mandalorians that would come to prove useful towards the end of the war. And this is followed by the 501st return to Coruscant, just as the Pantoran chairman Papa Noida's daughters were being kidnapped. Anakin thinks the Jedi can't officially get involved, but Ahsoka thinks she can help. And Rex is there watching as a senator and two Jedis discuss ways that they can get around the official rules. Should you really proceed without the Council's approval? We do it all the time, don't we, Snips? Yep. While these two years of fighting would show Rex that the world was a lot more complicated than just people following orders, the final battle of the year 21 BBY would be one of the most important for the entire war. The Republic was able to intercept a message from Ventress to Grievous, stating that their next target was Kamino. If someone comes to our home, they better be carrying a big blaster. I can go with Captain Rex, sir. This is personal for us clones. The fleet around Kamino is one of the most powerful, and Republic forces are confused how Grievous thinks he can overwhelm them. The fleet is not as large as I expected. Fighters, bombers, and capital ships open fire, blowing off large pieces of debris that fall into the watery world. Beneath the waves, Ventress is commanding aqua droids to assemble Trident-class assault craft. When the alarm goes off, Rex and the 501st are ready. Keep firing! We can beat these guys! The squid-like vehicle breaks through the domes of Taipoca City, and is able to insert countless battle droids, the effects of which are devastating to the clone birth chambers. A defective clone known as 99 is running guns and supplies to the 501st while under heavy droid blaster fire. As Fives, Echo, and 99 take refuge with the cadets in the barracks, they strategize on how they can raid the armory and hunker down and blast away any droids that came through this section. Everything we need is here! Excellent work, 99. But as the droids keep pouring into the hallway, the heroic 99 is cut down trying to get supplies to his brothers. We lost a true soldier. He really was one of us. And after Grievous and Ventress were sent running and the Republic was picking up the pieces, Cody and Rex pull Fives and Echo aside, announcing that they are officially inducted as ARC Troopers. Both of you showed valor out there. Real courage. Remind me of me, actually. Echo? Fives? 
You're both officially being made Ark Troopers. The opening of the year 20 BBY would see Jedi Master Even Feel taken prisoner and hauled off to the Citadel, what was thought to be the most impenetrable prison in the galaxy. CIS ship codes could get you in, but they were all scanned for any life forms. So Anakin came up with a creative solution. I've never been carbon frozen before, General. Yeah, it's the first time for us, too. If encased in carbonite, the slab should read as having no life forms. And with the help of R2 and some reprogrammed B1s, they were able to get onto the world Lola Seiyu. Once released from Carbonite, they notice that the Seppis have the main prison towers surrounded in layers of security that prevent both the use of jetpacks and even ascension cables. I suppose that means we free climb it. They were able to get up to the opening, but Charger loses his footing on a crumbling rock and tumbles off the side, colliding with the defensive measures and alerting the entire base. Automated laser cannons line the halls, as well as a sweeping pulse of electrical energy. Rex and Fives burst into the cell containing Peel and liberate the Jedi, but they are quickly set upon by the prison warden O.C. Sobek's customized commando droids. Magnetic field generators in the ceilings rip the weapons out of the trooper's hands, as well as pinning Anakin. With a combo of force pushes and arc trooper hand-to-hand -hand combat, they were able to engage the droids long enough for Anakin to disable the system. From here, the team make their way to freeing Will of Tarkin. Together, they race for the exit and set off explosives to cut off the pursuing droids. Using old schematics from the time that the base was in Republic hands, they cut out to one of the original base tunnels. As they snake around the complex, Tarkin expresses fears that they are being led by a child. Fear that is quickly squashed by Rex. I've sat with her many times, and I trust her, Captain. Just then they are attacked by even more droids, including the energy shield wielding commandos that are perfectly paired for these narrow passageways. But Ahsoka's improvising helps them get to the gas pipeline that will lead them to the extraction point. Meanwhile, Kenobi and his group were captured, but eventually freed by R2 and his B1s. Having to make it across the turbo laser encircled landing pad, the fighting is intense, with Tarkin being forced to admit that although the Jedi methods were unorthodox, so were their abilities. Rex, Fives, and Echo are blasting away at the droid waves, but Echo sees that a commando droid has mounted one of the turbo laser cannons and was bearing down on their only escape shuttle. Knowing this was their only way out, he rushed towards the ship to try and use its guns against the droids. Echo! Look out! But he was cut off by the powerful bolts, destroying the shuttle and engulfing Echo in the explosion, his singed helmet being the only thing Fives could see that remained of his brother. Rex and Fives would lead the rest of the forces through the tunnels, where they were set upon by even more commandos, followed by the ferocious Anuba, which would end up taking Master Peel's life. Knowing that there was no way left to escape this world, the Republic is forced to try and break through the Lola Seyu planetary fleet. On world, Fives would take the shot that brings down the Warden Speeder, while Ahsoka would deliver the death blow. And holding off the crab droids as they swarmed the landing LAAT, they were able to be extracted and escorted by Sacy Tin back to the Venator. While the next fight would be on the crucial Outer Rim world of Volusia, the 501st and the Wolfpack would be the main troop battalions. With ATTEs opening up on a CIS outpost, they would trick the clankers into an ambush. Wait for my move. Copy that. Rex and the boys would blast the droids as they exited, while Plo Koon would lead the jetpack troopers, and Ahsoka leading the grapple hook troopers on the third side. But while she was covering their flank, she was captured by a Trandoshan hunter. The next day, you can see how distraught Anakin and Rex were feeling. That's something that was thought unimaginable, that Ahsoka would just vanish without a trace in the middle of the battle. They searched all throughout the night and the following morning, but there was simply no sign of the Padawan. General, we've been over the same area a dozen times. There's no sign of Commander Tano. Not good enough, Rex. Try again. Though a Wookiee rescue team would end up saving her and many others from the notorious Trandoshan hunting grounds. The next time we see Rex is during the Battle of Harain in the Krantori system, the captain being surrounded by an entire droid battalion. Skywalker is being occupied by vulture droids, and Kenobi jokes that Rex will have to make do with him instead. And when he asks how he got into this, Rex explains that he was trying to save some local children, to which Kenobi praises the clone's character. But then something very odd happens. A deflector bolt severs a part of the B1's droid brain, causing it to take sides with the outnumbered humans. And Rex is fine with accepting a droid as long as it was blasting away the CIS clankers. And when he hears that the droid has a long alphanumeric designation too, he gives the droid a nickname just like his clone brothers, going from B10516 to just Bats. And as an OOM is about to have the spider droids open fire on their position, Bats rushes out and tells them to stop saying that he had taken the Republic forces as prisoner, just so he could get close and blast the other B1s in the head. While Obi and Rex shuffle away, Bats is still carrying on the fight. And looking upon the firefight, they see that their unlikely ally has been captured, and Rex wants to rescue him. 
In the CIS base, we see this new sense of identity has really taken hold. And crashing through this base, Obi and Rex have commandeered an AAT, and with their unlikely ally saved, they head over to the Republic evac point. This whole series of events shocked even Anakin, but Rex simply noted that you never know when an undercover battle droid may come in handy. But surely the things that Slick and Cut said must have come up in his mind, as he saw that even this droid could change so much as well. Then we would briefly see Rex on Mon Cala coordinating the delivery of Jedi and scuba troopers. All squadrons are in position, General Fisto. You may deploy when ready. Although he nor the 501st would take part in this battle. Rex's next fight would not be underwater, but in the perpetual darkness of Umbara. The fight in orbit was relatively quick, with fighters, three acclimators, and a venator smashing through the frigates. Setting up an atmosphere, Kenobi explains their roles. Masters Krell and Tin will be supporting my troops in the south, while Anakin's battalion comes in from the north and takes out enemy reinforcements. From the belly of the acclimator, the 501st erupts into the atmosphere via their LAAT gunships. The first sight of the militia forces were rushed by the ATRTs. The unique Umbaran tanks did kill some of the clone forces but the speed and nimbleness of the walkers helped to secure the LZ. And Rex displays his amazing battlefield awareness. Throughout all this chaos, he's able to identify a location that could give them the upper hand. Mass has a ridge at 23 degrees north, northwest. Good, we can use it as a staging area. From here, they could set up a forward base. And Rex wonders how Kenobi's forces were doing. Just then, Dogma comes up and is stiff and wanting to seem like he doesn't need a break. Rex tells his fellow 501st trooper that this was an order but assures Anakin that the trooper is fine. <laughs> he kind of reminds me of you. Maybe back in the day. In what was almost the final year of the war, we see that Rex and Skywalker are aware of how much these battles have changed him. Seeing that Dogma was more rigid and robotic, like how all of the clones were trained to act on Kamino. Later that night, the base was surrounded by the Umbarans. Scrambling to defend, Rex comes up with a plan to retreat and call in an airstrike on the forward base's position. There's an opening to our south. I recommend we move all platoons off the ridge in case the airstrike overshoots. Good thinking, Rex. The air support was provided by Jedi General Pong Krell, but as he lands, he informs Skywalker that the Council has recalled him to Coruscant, that Krell will take command of the entire 501st. Master Krell, this is Rex, my first in command. You won't find a finer or more loyal trooper anywhere. But as soon as Skywalker is off the battlefield, Krell treats the boys the way the Kaminoans had trained them, him even opening with an insult. Very interesting, Captain, that you are able to recognize the value of honor for a clone. And berates Rex for not following some of the smaller protocols, telling him to stand at attention and no longer use their nicknames. The kind of rigid denial of self that Dogma had just embodied earlier really showing how loving leaders like Kenobi and Anakin had respected their clones as individuals, causing them to develop really strong identities. Fives complains about the general style, but Rex just tries to keep him focused on finishing the mission. He's in charge, and we've got a job to do. Just treat him with respect, and we'll all get along fine. But even after an attack by local wildlife, Krell forces them to keep marching at the same pace for what was 12 hours at this point. I ask you a question, CT-7567. Do you understand the need to adhere to my strategy? Sir. Once they finally do near the capital, Krell tells them that the orders are to launch a full frontal attack, simply overwhelm the Umbaran defenses, instead of Skywalker's original plan to launch several smaller coordinated attacks. As they march, we see that Fives and many others do what would have been thought impossible with the gene engineering and military programming over their entire lives. They openly question the general's orders. But what if he's wrong? Then what? This isn't the time for a debate. Right now we have to stay alert. Mines placed on the road would kill many, and then the whole causeway is swarmed with militia forces. Eventually they have to pull back to regroup, but are able to push the Umbarans into the capital. But this failure to keep pushing outraged the general. Well, Do you have a malfunction in your design? This entire operation has been compromised because of your failure! Captain Rex just saved this platoon. Surely you won't fail to recognize that. Rex explains why he changed the plans, but then loses his cool and addresses what all the clones were feeling. That this general just saw them as expendable meat droids. A plan that cost us men, not clones, men! As they regroup and try to take the capital, Umbaran fighters now arrive and make things even more difficult. Rex takes the lead and orders the troopers across the battlefront. Then Kenobi makes contact to advise that they take the airfield before moving on the capital. Quickly heading over the canyon, they spot their target, but Krell wants to employ the same tactics. All the clones are upset about rushing through a narrow passage. All but Dogma, that is. The casualties are going to be high. Is Krell trying to get us killed? 
and as Fives is the most vocal and the second highest ranking, Rex pulls him aside. And here we see the struggle with Rex as the one in charge, he's trying to maintain order. But Fives has to challenge him on it. Do you believe that? Or is that what you were engineered to think? I honor my code. That's what I believe. Fives wasn't even there when Rex and Cut were discussing things, and yet one of his closest friends, not a deserter or a traitor, was making some of the same points. But without any other options, they continue on, where they were ambushed by the impeding assault tanks. 501st scrambled, trying to figure out how to defeat this strange and deadly vehicle, Rex having to coordinate the use of many thermal detonators and rocket launchers to disable them, being clever enough to use the narrow terrain to the clone's advantage, and eliminating any survivors. Not just left in him either. And so here you see the coldness of their new general was already rubbing off on them, with Rex's callousness towards those wounded Umbarans, and kick slaughtering any wildlife along the way. But then the most deadly vehicle in the Umbaran military, the mobile heavy tank, arrived. Still, Krell orders a direct attack. I used to think General Krell was reckless, but now I'm beginning to think he just hates clothes. Even the simultaneous strike of three rockets to the cockpit did nothing to this impressive vehicle. And though Fives urged Rex to reconsider, he rushed in until it was clear that there was no hope. I've dispatched two men on a stealth incursion into the airbase. They've been ordered to co-opt starfighters. Fives and Hardcase would be able to sneak into the base and take control of these powerful fighters. By using rockets, Rex was able to disable some of the guns on the tanks, but still the cockpit and armor was unscratched. That is, until the Umbaran starfighters were used against them, allowing the 501st to make it through this valley and secure the airfield. The remaining Umbarans were taken prisoner, and Krell just chalks it up to luck, which Rex is not having. It wasn't all luck, sir. A lot of men died to take this base. The price for such victory. As the base is being reinforced, the militia continues to launch small attacks on the base and against Kenobi's forces. When Rex reveals the plan to simply rush the capital, despite it being reinforced by CIS supply ships, Jesse and Five step up and try to get Rex to understand that there is another option. That's it? We just march into those missiles? We go ahead with our plan and suffer the consequences. Though they have to cut it short when Dogma comes in. Rex feels torn. He knows the General's plans are terrible, but he's also the one in charge of maintaining order in the 501st and upholding this command structure. He sees it as not having honor and respect for the GAR, and that he is saving all of them from being court-martialed. The Fives has to be the one to reinforce what Rex already feels. Where is the honor in marching blindly to our deaths? Sorry. I cannot just follow orders when I know they're wrong, but I am not just another number. None of us are! Rex knows Fives is right and makes sure to cover for him in their mission to attack the supply ship. But that night, Dogma notices that Fives, Hardcase, and Jesse are missing. Already making their approach through the battle and atmosphere, Rex claims that he ordered them to use the ships to recon the capital, and intercepts Dogma and Tup before they're able to tell Krell. Why don't you tell me, and I'll report it to the General. Once they made it way onto the supply ship, the fighters were stopped by a blast doors just before the main reactor. But Hardcase has a solution. This is for the 501st! The removable payload could be brought around and detonated manually. Hardcase would go with it, but these powerful supplies to the capital were being cut off, saving countless clones from both the 501st and the 212th in the upcoming assault. But Krell did not find this praiseworthy. You committed a serious crime by directly disobeying my order. And though Rex and Fives plead that they should be the ones to blame, Krell orders that Fives and Jesse be executed that evening. Rex, you have to face it. He's been using you. He needs your loyalty to control the others. I won't let him get away with this. The firing squad would be led by Dogma, and despite their pleas, he orders the troops to fire. They did pull the trigger on their DC-15s, but no one could bring themselves to be the clone that fired into the bodies of one of their brothers. They're doing the right thing, Dogma because if this is how soldiers are rewarded for heroic actions, then one day, every man in this battalion may face a similar fate. And then he had to confront the Jedi General, telling him that the clones will not be executed. You are making a mistake by crossing me, clone. It's Captain, sir. But they were interrupted by reports that the Umbarans were donning clone arms and armor and working their way to ambush the 501st. They come upon them in the fluorescent jungles, and the firefight was intense, many being killed on both sides. But it was Rex that noticed that under the helmet, it looked like a clone brother. Look! We're clones! We're all clones! Waxer from the 212th was critically wounded, but said that Krell told them to come to this location and intercept the imposters. Rex was certain of what he had to do now. 
What I'm proposing is highly treasonous. Together, these combined forces go to arrest the general. It's treason, then. But Dogma still can't bring himself to let this happen. Knowing the protocol, he sees them all as traitors. I used to believe that being a good soldier meant doing everything they told you. That's how they engineered us. But we're not droids. Rex's words sink in, and he lowers his blaster. While the rest of the clones continue to pursue Krell into the jungle, he then plays on Fives and Rex's relationship. You should have listened to the Ark Trooper from the beginning, Captain. He was right. He was right. I was using you. And though several more brothers would be killed, Tup was the one that fired on the Jedi and stunned him, and they imprisoned the general right next to Dogma, where Rex demanded an explanation. Why kill your own men? And much like Dooku's warning to Kenobi right before the war started, Rex gets a truthful explanation, but just one he could not accept. A new power is rising. I've foreseen it. The Jedi are going to lose this war, and the Republic will be ripped apart from the inside. As the clones leave the prison, they are informed that the capital was taken, but now the rest of the Umbaran militia was headed towards the airbase. If they freed Krell, he could turn over precious Republic military secrets. Krell was simply too dangerous to be kept alive, and Rex decided he would be the one to execute him. Just as Krell evoked the ability to deliver capital punishment for treason on the battlefront, so too Rex would use these grounds to kill the Jedi. But Krell sensed the fear in 7567, as this went against everything in his being. Just then, a blue bolt whizzed from behind Rex, killing Krell instantly. Dogma, the clone who was so rigidly following orders, snapped when he heard the general admit how stupid he thought the clones were. But Dogma was the lowest of them all, and he used these clones then forced them to meaningless deaths with his purposely wasteful tactics. And now he planned to join the Separatists. Dogma's lifelong, simplistic worldview was destroyed, knowing that these clones that he called traitors and almost executed were the heroes all along and his Jedi General was actually the enemy. Though Dogma was still taken away, Rex gives him a comforting nod. But with Fives, you see that this latest of betrayals has Rex questioning everything. Slick betrayed him, Cut turned his back on them, and now a Jedi was taking pleasure in seeing his clone brothers die. Believing the clones were disposable, and thinking his own Jedi Order would fall, and then the Republic. If all of them could change, then what was a clone's place in all of this? What's the point of all this? I mean, why? That someday, this war is gonna end. Then what? We're soldiers. What happens to us then? But the next battle would help to reinstill the idea that the Republic was doing good in the galaxy. Kairos was the home to the peace-loving Togruta colonists, but hours before, the CIS had launched an invasion, resulting in the 501st and 212th teaming up again to liberate the civilians. A Zagirian was leading the Separatist assault, a species Anakin instantly recognized as a slaver. The slaver wanted to meet with Kenobi to talk surrender terms, and tells the Jedi that there were bombs placed all across the city. Annie and Ahsoka were able to disarm them, and intercept the slaver's ship as it attempted to flee, where Anakin loses it on the scum, and it's revealed that the colonists were already moved to Zagiria, with the Queen's hopes that they could use the Clone Wars to rebuild their slave empire. But stealing the slaver's ship and donning traditional Zygerian outfits, they head to the capital to figure out where the other Togruta slaves were. And the plan was to have Anakin sell off Ahsoka to the Queen, meanwhile Rex and Kenobi search the open-air cells. They only found one feeble, elderly Togruta, but they were shot down as they were trying to escape, forcing Rex to continue on without them, though he was also captured. They were brought together in what was supposed to be a fight to the death, where the Republic forces turn on the slavers, but with their Electro Whips, the Zygerians were able to subdue them and put them in chains, transferring them over to the Slave Processing Center and Work Camp. To set the tone, many were dropped into a bottomless pit, while the Queen was still trying to court Anakin. In the sweltering hot foundry, many were being worked to death, and even these two hardened warriors were becoming ragged, as Rex watched on helplessly as Kenobi pleaded with the slavers to be less cruel. Hearing how the average citizen saw the Jedi intervention. Keep away from me. Jedi only make things worse. Skywalker had started his escape, rescuing Ahsoka from her cage and going to confront Dooku and the Queen. The Count turned on her, and Anakin uses their bond to be able to find Rex and Kenobi. With the coordinates relayed to the Republic, support was on its way. This is Warthog. We're going in. Rex, now! Their hand to hand combat skills bested the guards, with Rex killing the slave keeper Argus. Soko was able to free a majority of the Togruta, and the Wolfpack's jet troopers were able to get them onto an Arquidens, while LAATs evac the rest of the team, blowing up the whole facility on the way out. 
From liberating slaves, they would go on to train Onderanian rebels, with a young Lux Bonteri and Saul Guerrero being instructed by the Jedi. Again, Rex seeing that things weren't so black and white. In this gray area, the Republic would not officially want to get involved, but they also didn't want it to fall to the CIS. And so the Jedi would secretly help them, with Rex showing up there in rebel armor. And he ran blaster drills with both pistols and sniper rifles, explaining how the droids can keep fighting as long as their droid brain was not destroyed. A headshot is the only decisive way to disable a droid. They don't need arms, legs, or even bodies to pass intel to Central Command. But just then, battle droids swarmed them. Saul's sister Stila was an ace shot and something of a leader of these forces, with Anakin by her side while Rex led the rebels in the streets, eventually working their way to the power grid, knowing that without it, the droids would eventually have to power down. The nighttime raid was a success, striking both a moral and practical victory, occurring right in the shadow of the royal palace that was aligning with the CIS. Though they would leave Ahsoka behind to finish the training, Stila fought so well that she earned Rex's praise. Stila is a born leader. And quite courageous, I am. Now in the final year of the Clone Wars, the Jedi Temple had been bombed, with the Council believing that it was a fallen Jedi that carried it out. But the investigation revealed it to be an anti-war activist whose husband was working at the temple. She used explosive nanodroids, turning her own husband into a walking bomb. And this event shows how the public was turning against the Jedi. Public opinion is swaying against the Jedi, that is becoming clear. This war is becoming less and less popular every day it persists. But when the bomber wants Ahsoka to visit her in her cell, everyone is confused by this but hopes that she can uncover more information. And on camera, the clone security watch as the prisoner is lifted off her feet and choked to death. I can't say I blame you, Commander Tano, but all the same, you're under arrest. When Ahsoka escapes, there is a trail of dead clones in her wake, all killed by lightsaber strikes. Commander Fox opens fire, accepting that this was just another fallen Jedi like Krell, and he orders all of his troops to shoot on sight. Belay that order, Commander Fox. She's killed troopers. I know, Commander Tano. She would never do something like this. When she refuses to listen to even Anakin, Rex is forced to give the most difficult command of his entire service. On Commander Ahsoka Tano. She's killed three clones and should be considered armed and dangerous. Coruscant guard pursue her towards the fuel depot area of the base, while her master and her friend Rex watch on as she continues to evade capture. Eventually, Anakin would catch up with her and pleads with the Padawan, with Rex and Fox showing up just in time to see her jump onto a transport down to the lower levels. Later, one of the most extensive clone search teams was formed, involving Fox and the Coruscant guard, Wolfpack and Plo Koon, and Anakin in the 501st, with Wolf being the one to fire the stun bolt that captures her. Everyone aboard the LAAT transporting the prisoner was devastated, as she was found alongside the same kind of explosive nanobots that were used in the attacks. But Anakin still won't believe that she was a traitor and murderer, so in searching the shipments of these explosives, he discovers that Ventress is in the lower levels helping Ahsoka escape, and furiously wants to know why. Meanwhile, Tarkin would lead the prosecution against the Padawan, calling for the ultimate sentence to be brought down upon this traitor. Including penalty of death. But Ventress reveals that Ahsoka had been contacted by a certain Barriss before heading to the nanobot warehouse. And the Sith assassin says that it must have been a Jedi that snuck up on her. When confronted, the Crimson Blades are activated, and Anakin fights her across the temple complex, trying to ensure that she is captured alive. That we've so lost our way that we have become villains in this conflict. An army fighting for the dark side. While Barriss' testimony frees Ahsoka, this whole deal has too deeply shook the little one. The Jedi Council apologize, and everyone is happy to welcome her back into the Order. I'm asking you back. I'm sorry, Master. But I'm not coming back. Rex is not there to see her walk away would hear of it from Anakin. Both knowing each other were devastated at losing her, but they would have to get back to the fight without her, and the battle for Ringo Vinda would be difficult for many reasons. The Republic forces would push through this planetary ring, encountering wave after wave of battle droids. Doom and his unit would provide crucial shield cover to block the droidicas, where we see a lot of examples of how the Republic has learned these various droids' weaknesses. With Rex leading the boys in blue, Five notices that Tup was looking off. I, I don't feel like myself. Next was to assault Admiral Trench's position. The large room was full of hostiles, but Tup seems to snap into a trance. Good soldiers follow orders. And without emotions, walks up to Tiplar and points the blaster to her head, and fires. Fives would be the one to tackle and arrest Tup, 
while the Republic lost its momentum and was forced to retreat. When Trench shows Dooku the hollow footage of the event, the Sith knows exactly what went wrong. How's he doing, Rex? I'm not sure, General. Tup was in a trance. Could soldiers follow orders? Could soldiers follow orders? With everyone watching on in horrified confusion. For Rex, these betrayals are getting closer to home. Was he so blind not to see that his close brother in the 501st was harboring such a hatred for the Jedi? No one is sure what to do, but the best clone medical experts would be back on Kamino. Meanwhile, Dooku rushes to inform Sidious of this incident, which may end up accidentally revealing this decades-long plot. And you believe this is indicative of our programming? But Tup seems genuinely confused as well. You don't remember? No. It seems he's had some sort of breakdown. Kix, you should know better. We were designed to withstand any stress. On a new class shuttle transporting the disturbed trooper, Dooku had an HMP droid gunship with buzz droid firing discord missiles and a squad of V2 rocket troopers sent to intercept him, also wanting to keep Tup alive to figure out what went wrong in the clone's brain. Rex and Fives would scramble out to the crash site with Anakin, finding no survivors on board. To rescue their missing brother, they would be delivered behind enemy lines to a section of the ring still controlled by the Separatists. Just a three-man team, stealthy spacewalk gives them eyes on their target. By firing on the transport with grapple guns, they were able to make their way into the craft before it made the jump to hyperspace, quickly eliminating the Resistance and the T-Series droid before bringing Tup back to the Republic side. Now on a much more secure transport, Tup would finally start the trip to Kamino. But Fives makes a special request of Rex, which he grants, also wanting to have an ARC trooper by Tup's side. All Rex also worries that if Fives does anything reckless, that would be two troopers from Rex's command that will be seen as dishonorable. Permission to come with you, sir. He's my best friend. You may need help, but everything must be done by the book. Upon arriving on Kamino, Shock T tries to comfort Fives, but tells him that he has to be monitored as well, with the most likely explanation being that this was some sort of Separatist-made virus, and Fives may have also been exposed to it. Take care of yourself. Add top. But early on, Fives is resistant to sit by as Tup is subjugated to a painful battery of tests, all which say he's in perfect health. But the medical droid reveals that more knowledge could be gained via an atomic level scan. But Nala Se recommends that the clone be eliminated and examined via autopsy. I do not believe this is a physical ailment, but a mental condition caused by possible separatist brainwashing. The Jedi Council agrees that the trooper's mind should be searched for signs of brainwashing, and thus should be brought to the Jedi Temple to be examined through the Force. The Kaminoans know that this was a malfunction with the inhibitor chip, causing the execution of Clone Protocol 66, and they contact Lord Tyrannus, who they still think is with the Jedi Order. Sifo Diaz, the Jedi who commissioned the clone army, having designated this mysterious lord in his absence. These Jedi are a curious cult. Tup is able to convince the medical droid that carrying out this atomic scan is the only way to follow his programming, to do what is best for the patient, and they discover what they believe to be a tumor. But when the doctor comes back, she refuses to accept these results, forcing Fives and the droid to create a distraction and carry out an operation of their own. The mass is taken out, and Shock T walks in on Say trying to strip it away. But as the trooper explains that this was the cause of Tup snapping, his friend comes back to consciousness and starts to mutter something. What mission? You... You know the one. The one in our dreams. That never ends. The one in our dreams. Forget the mission. Oh, the nightmare. I'm... Pray. His best friend died on their homeworld, and Palpatine and Say convinced Shock T to have the sample sent to the Grand Army's facilities on Coruscant, instead of using the Jedi Temple facilities. Fives would be sent back to the warfront, or so he was told. I heard your mind was going to be wiped, and that you would be reassigned here and placed on sanitation detail. Resulting in an amazing display of ARC Trooper training. They make a run for it, finding that Say had switched the cases to trick the Jedi. Certain that something sinister was going on, they make it appear like they escaped via Kaminoan's sphere ship, while actually going back to the labs to study the tumor further. When Dooku wants an update, we see that both are frustrated by this emergent individualism inspired by the Jedi, turning what should have been essentially biological robots into people capable of bothersome traits like friendship. However, he was a friend to the clone which malfunctioned. The medical droid sees that there is no way that this was a random mutation of the Django Fett genome. It is foreign to the body. Someone implanted it there. 
Upon their discovery, they race through the tunnels and back to an operating room. It is revealed that Fives has this biochip in him as well. Perhaps the entire clone army has this ticking time bomb within them. My analysis suggests implantation took place at the earliest stage of development. Most likely when you and Tup were only embryos. Prompting Fives to head to the growth chambers. The earliest stage fetuses show nothing, but the third stage does. All of the clones from then on out have this chip. And as the Kaminoans, Troopers, and Shakti arrive, the scientist tries to claim that it was simply to make them less aggressive than Django. But Fives doesn't believe it, and the Jedi knows this is too important to just take the cloner's word for it. And the shuttle takes him to the same medical station that would one day repair Vader. Say had covertly injected Fives to make him seem disoriented and aggressive. And when they meet the Chancellor, Palpatine says that he wants the Kaminoan and Jedi to leave the room, to let the trooper speak freely, without fear of offending the cloners that raised him, or the Jedi that were leading him through this war. But with the doors closed, Palpatine actually reveals the entire secret Sith plan to Fives, causing him to try and kill the Chancellor, seeming to prove the Kaminoan's point. You were right, Doctor. He must have gone mad without his chip. And the Jedi were not sure what to make of this. But with their own suspicions of the origins of the clone army, they need him alive. Fives was part of the 501st. If Rex and I find him, he'll trust us. And that was what Fives was hoping, as we see when he confides in Kix, who he runs into at a famous clone bar on Coruscant. I have to talk to General Skywalker and Rex directly. Alone. Giving him the coordinates to meet up with the only people he thinks he can trust. But he was picked up by one of Commander Fox's probe droids. Scarred by this whole experience, he still insists that his friends put down their weapons. I'm putting my pistols down. And leads them into a ray shield to ensure that they simply listen to what he has to say. But the Kaminoan's injection was taking effect, and making him seem tired and insane. But despite this, he was still able to reveal the plot. Evidence is in here. It's, it, it's in here. It's in all of us. And he reveals that the Chancellor is somehow behind all of this. As Fox's men race in, Fives panics and goes for Rex's blasters, whipping around towards the Coruscant guard, but being dropped with a single bolt to the chest. Fives, stay with me, Fives. The nightmares. They're finally over. The samples in the hands of the Chancellor and the Kaminoans, a bogus explanation was concocted. Parasite. Native to Ringo Binda. We see that though Rex did not openly protest this at the time, he told the other troopers of Five's account, and found a way to record these objections and hope that they could one day be discovered. Now just months away from the conclusion of the Sith's plans, the Separatists launch a daring attack on the world Scipio, a neutral world and center of the intergalactic banking clan, and Padme was on world during this CIS invasion. But initial scan suggests she's still alive, sir. The fleet carrying the 501st emerged from hyperspace, and Dooku and his fleet jumped to safety, abandoning Rush Clovis and the ground forces to take on the Republic alone. Hold the droid forces here! I'm gonna push on and get Padme! Copy that! The CIS attack on their world, and the Republic promising to simply protect but not interfere with the banking, the IBC makes a historic decision. We cede control of the banks to the office of the Chancellor of the Galactic Republic. From here, the 501st was sent to defend Anaxis, one of the Republic's most important shipyards. The CIS keeps outmaneuvering them, and though Trench is considered a military genius, this was something else. Rex has had some suspicions and explains what he thinks is going on to the Jedi Generals. It's my strategy that droids know. My playbook. And Anakin suspects that Rex has more in his mind, which he does, but he only tells this to Cody, as he looks upon a photo of his fallen friends, all who have been claimed by this war. Fives, Echo, before that heavy. There's so many troopers, gone. Sometimes in war, it's hard to be the one that survives. That's what I'm worried about. He tells Cody what he was afraid to admit to the Jedi. I think Echo's alive. Their first target would be the Separatist Cipher Center, and joining them would be the unconventional Clone Force 99, named after the hero of the Battle of Kamino. When their transport is shot down, Rex is quick to try and rescue Cody, but Wrecker's strength mutations were incredible. And as hundreds of droids descend on them, Hunter explains that they fight a bit more aggressive than the regs. Though seemingly reckless, their tactics worked. But as they made their way to the target and set up camp for the night, 501st boys and Bad Batch get into a scuffle over who's in command. You can't talk to Captain Rex like that. Says who? Oh! The following morning, they take an outpost and press on to the Cypher Center, storming the facility with blinding speed and deadly efficiency. 
breaching the doors and reducing every droid in sight to scrap metal. With Tech cracking the system, he's able to track the signal that is providing the Republic strategies, and it comes from Skako Minor. But it isn't a program, it's a live signal. CT-1409. I don't believe it. Rex's suspicions have been confirmed, and the team has to flee before being overwhelmed by droid reinforcements. Back at Ford Axis, Anakin discusses the fact that the Council is unlikely to approve this strike on Skako Minor, and so they should deploy before they get official denial. And then we see that after all these years, from the time Anakin helped an unconscious Rex out of a ditch on Arantara, through all the countless firefights, he was now close enough with the Captain to entrust him with his greatest held secret. First, we have that thing. This is clearly something the two have done many times by now, and Rex knows the routine. He stands guard as the Jedi makes a call to his wife, Padme. And we see how concerned the General is for Rex, and also how well Padme knows and trusts the clone captain as well. Trust his instincts, like he trusts yours. The clone is aware that this is a forbidden love, and of all people, Kenobi cannot find out, who of course shows up looking for Skywalker. He is able to hold him off long enough, but shockingly, Obi-Wan just openly calls him out on it, having known for some time that this has been going on. I hope you at least told Padme I said hello. The Sith and Kaminoan certainly underestimated the way the Jedi would treat these clone soldiers, and how these products would develop complex bonds of their own over the course of the Clone Wars. But now Bad Batch's ship was ready for takeoff, and they head to liberate Echo. And we see the captain is still known for learning all there is to know about the mission. What do we know about this place? On this part of Skako, there's a race of locals, the Poltics. Though these locals would capture them, General Rex reminds everyone to watch their fire. No casualties, disarm only. With the help of tech, they were able to communicate with the villagers and explain their mission. But as they near the location of the Separatist facility, there was still no sign of that signal, seeming to prove everyone else's suspicion that Echo was dead, and this was all a trap. When Crosshair continues to provoke Rex, the clone, once as rigid in protocol as Dogma, snaps on the Bad Batch. I would have left him for dead too. Besides, he's just another rig. When the fight is broken up, Anakin has to admit his fears as well. But Rex assures him that he knows Echo is alive. Finally making it to the station, they are met with the rare flying D-Wing droids, but are now able to get a lock on Echo. When they find the source of the signal, Wat Tambor taunts Rex. I am leaving here with my friend. Your friend is dead. His mind is ours. And while the droid reinforcements come, Hunter gives the captain well wishes. Rex and Tech are able to break into the chamber, and attached to a large computer mainframe is a device which appears to house a human body. Opening the hatch, Echo falls forward, eyes twitching, half-robotic body, with many wires plugged into him. Rex is hit with a wave of conflicting emotions. What have they done to you? More droid reinforcements come, and Tech believes that he has successfully liberated Echo from the computer systems, but he's still in incredible pain. I got a big headache. <laughs> Better to feel something than nothing, old buddy. With Rex helping his old friend through the tunnels, Echo reveals that he may know the way out. Making their way outside, they are forced to leap onto the Kyradex and head back to Poltec City. The natives were outraged that the Republic brought the war to them. Rex gives a speech on how Echo is an example of what the CIS will eventually do to anyone that they deem their enemy. But look what the Separatists did to one of our people. When the D-Wing and Octoptara come to level the village, these combined forces were able to win the day, with Rex giving one of his trusty DC-17 pistols to Echo, and Anakin doing some impressive maneuvers on the Tri-Droid, reminiscent of the Battle of Christophsis years ago, back when Rex and the General hardly knew each other. But when they leave Skako, Echo thanks Rex, but is unsure how easy it will be to join his brothers after all this time, where every moment of his being was a cybernetic digital nightmare state. Hopefully it's going to be just like old times. Yeah, just like old times. During the next briefing at Fort Anaxis, Echo wants to join, but Rex is skeptical. Though Mace and the Jedi are open to hearing any idea, Echo explains that he can hack into their systems if he can be delivered onto Trench's flagship. But this all seems too fishy to tech. His mind belonged to the Separatists until we unplugged him. We don't really know where his loyalties lie. With that possibility now in the back of Rex's mind, they make their approach, with Echo masking the ship's signature as a Separatist shuttle. The same type of shuttle that Echo was trying to secure back on Lola Seiyu. The Jedi would lead the rest of the Republic's forces to reclaim the shipyards, with dozens of gunships and bombers. Trench calls on his cybernetic algorithm that he still believes is on Skako Minor, and they have to make it seem like the signal is coming from that planet, 
even while they are inside of Trench's ship. Luckily, they are able to mask it, telling Trench to send all of the remaining droid forces to crush the Republic at this one location. Echo says that once they're all in the shipyard, he will send a relay pulse to disable them all in one move. But though Bad Batch worries this could be a trap, Rex trusts his brother. We have to trust him. Rex is right. Echo, we're all counting on you. The plan works and the droids are disabled, but it gives away Echo in the system. Trench overloads in return, knocking him unconscious while Anakin makes his way to the bridge. The CIS Admiral had placed an enormous bomb in the shipyard as a failsafe. And once the code was revealed and his attack on Anakin failed, Trench was finally killed for good. While the strike team makes it off the ship, leaving a trail of droid destruction in their wake. Honestly, I feel bad for those droids. The entire fleet would be destroyed with the self-destruct code, and once returning to the fort, Rex welcomes Echo back into the 501st. But Hunter sees the faraway stare on Echo's eyes. If you ever feel like you don't fit in with them, well, find us. And Rex doesn't want to force his friend's decision. You and I go way back. If that's where you feel your place is, then that's where you belong. Now you can see in Rex's face that it hurts him, and he hopes that Echo will come to the 501st. He salutes his old friend. Sometime before the Battle of Urbana, Rex and Jesse would have a run-in with Quinlan Voss, who had turned to the dark side and was working with Dooku. The clones were unloading equipment on an asteroid when the fallen Jedi helped to save their lives, making them think that the Jedi was still in the light. Now we are just days before the end of the Clone Wars. On the Outer Rim planet of Urbana, this would be one of the last times the 501st and 212th would fight side by side. And we find Kenobi's forces are pinned down on a crucial bridge. Where's Captain Rex? Anakin goes out to fake a surrender, but once the tactical droid has been spotted and eliminated, the 501st blasts out from under the bridge with their jetpacks and clears the way for the 212th. With the victory, Yularen recalls them back to the Venator in orbit where Anakin cannot believe his eyes. How are you? Where are you? Are, are you okay? And she says that she has teamed up with the Mandalorians to try and capture Maul. Once she and Anakin are in person, he explains that the clones have not forgotten what she did for them. The countless battles she fought alongside them. Company! Attention! As soon as Rex and the guys knew you were back, they got to work. We also see that Anakin entrusted Rex with holding onto Ahsoka's sabers. When they are interrupted by Grievous's invasion of Coruscant, Anakin tries to think up of a way to not let Ahsoka down, and to give her the Republic support she desperately needed. I'll divide the 501st. We'll promote Rex to commander and have him lead the new division. Ahsoka can go with him as an advisor. The 332nd Company would descend onto Mandalore with the combined Mandalorian and Republic ships, while the mall trained and stylized Super Commandos prepare for the largest battle to encompass this world in centuries, perhaps millennia. As they weave through the flak in the LA-80s, Rex prepares his jetpack and loves having the not-so-little one back. Racing to the surface! The first of the Maul DeLoreans would be pushed back in the firefight at the LZ, while Ahsoka is still able to joke with her old friend. Hey, you. Some things never change. They press into the capital, and Ahsoka tells Rex to lock down the docks in case Maul tries to escape there. But Commander Rex is well aware of the larger picture here, knowing that with the Sith, you never knew if you were being a pawn. If he's not, then all of this plays right into his hands. Ahsoka would rush down in the sewers to track Gar Saxon and his forces. And Rex's intuition was right, but not how any of them predicted. It was a trap, but all of this to satisfy Maul's lust for revenge against Kenobi and eliminate Anakin. By activating her comm, Rex and his group were able to hear that she was trapped, and came to the rescue. They fought Maul's forces off through these narrow tunnels, though he would slip away. When the combined forces regroup, Kenobi updates Ahsoka, Rex, and Bo-Katan on the events of the Battle of Coruscant. But there was one thing he did not feel comfortable sharing with the Mandalorian, or even Rex. May I speak to Ahsoka alone for a moment? As he reveals the fact that Anakin was tasked with spying on the Supreme Chancellor. Rex bursts back in to say that Maul has struck back. Rushing down into another tunnel complex, a clone tells them that the Zabrak had taken Jesse alive. Who is this? Ahsoka Not knowing where he has gone, Rex and the Republic forces head to the prisoner cell of Prime Minister Almec. But before any information is revealed, Saxon eliminates him with two sniper bolts. Though his dying words say that Maul was plagued by a nightmare vision of the future, that all focused on one name, Skywalker. The rest of the Joint Republic forces pursued the sniper throughout the prison complex, though he would get back to the rest of the Super Commando forces. 
and we see that the Republic has taken charge of relocating the citizens of Mandalore. This is for their safety, but Bo-Katan knows that this will be seen as being held captive by the Republic. I will not stand for it. You ask for our help. My men don't want to be acting as a police force. As they debate this point walking up to the throne room, we see the fallen Sith upon the Mandalorian throne. And now is a show of good faith. I return your comrade in arms to you. Rex, get him out of here. As Maul pleads with her to join him, Rex and Bo lead the combined forces against the Super Commandos. But when he reveals that this whole Mandalorian civil war was created to draw out Kenobi and Skywalker, thus getting his revenge on the man who cut him down years ago on Naboo, and denying his former Sith Master the prized apprentice that he had been grooming for years, Ahsoka is unable to believe that Anakin would fall to the dark side. Thinking that she is being tricked, she activates her lightsabers. Their fight would spill out to the city, with the forces retreating volleys of jetpack rockets and powerful fire from the ATT, but the Tano helmeted troopers would win the day. The Republic taking many Super Commandos prisoner, and Rex personally arresting Saxon, shoving him to the ground. Unsure of what happened to Ahsoka, Rex is the one to spot the lightsaber battle far above them. When she sends the Sith flying off the beam and force held in midair, it is Rex who fires the stun bolt that finally brings Maul into Republic custody. A joint effort from these two would come a long way from that first meeting on Christophsis. The next morning, the remaining forces were being processed, when Rex informs Ahsoka that they were ready for the meeting. I have the council waiting. More of the details of these final battles are relayed, but when the conversation turns to the Supreme Chancellor, Mace shuts it down in a way that you can see Rex visually shaken by. I'm sorry, citizen. These matters are for the council to discuss. But equally surprising was what Ahsoka withheld. You didn't tell them what Maul said about General Skywalker. Rex was not there in the throne room when Maul explained the vision of Skywalker turning to the dark side. So in these few hours that passed, Ahsoka made sure to confide this in Rex, her and Anakin's closest friend outside of the Jedi Order. Now they had to transport Maul to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant, all with the aid of a Mandalorian ancient force wielder prison chamber. A detachment of the 332nd would stay with Bo-Katan's forces on Mandalore. While these two war-hardened friends stared out of the bridge of the Venator, they reminisce how both have been soldiers for most of their lives. But all I've been since I was a Padawan is a soldier. Well, I've known no other way. Many people wish it never happened. But without it, we clones wouldn't exist. And after the briefing, Rex receives a message that would change the galaxy forever. Yes, Lord Sidious. Rex and Ahsoka's bond is incredible, allowing him to fight off this impulse created by the inhibitor chip. Trembling and shedding a tear, he is able to buy precious seconds to give her the clues she needs to understand this apparent betrayal. But fight him! Her years of fighting alongside these clones, surrounded by countless bolts of incoming droid fire, ended up preparing her for her escape deflecting bolt after bolt in a blinding flurry, using those shots to melt away an opening in the ceiling. But we tried to fight it, Rex was now under the full control of the bio-inhibitor chip. Ahsoka would free Maul in order to create a distraction. While Ahsoka is still confused, Maul pieces it all together. Now I see it. He turned the Jedi's own army against them. And now all of Rex's thoroughness and intelligence would be put to use trying to kill the Jedi he once called Little One. Destroy the escape pods and increase security on the hangar decks. Ironically, it's the droids on board that are shocked to learn of the clones turning against the Jedi. Their own emergent personality shocked that beings could so blindly follow their programming. Her master always taught her to believe in luck, and as luck or the force would have it, Ahsoka's old droid R7A7 was on this Venator, and using Anakin's old code, he gave her access to Fives' record leading her to see a grievance claim fired by Rex after the incident. I owe it to Fives to record what I saw. Either the inhibitor chips the Kaminoans put inside us have a purpose that we don't yet fully understand. As planned, Maul was causing havoc in the passageways, helping Ahsoka put in her plan to trap and talk to Rex. I think I know what's happening. I saw your report on Fives. Using the droids to stun and transport him to the medbay. Combined with the scanning equipment, the astromechs, and the FX7 medical droid, they try to locate this chip. But even the facilities on Kamino did not catch it. It was only that atomic level scan that found it. The only option was to hope on guidance from the Force. I'm one with the Force, and the Force is with me. This area revealed, the surgery would be quick, but the 332nd boys were breaking in. 
Overwhelming Ahsoka's defenses, she was almost cut down when a bolt from a DC-17 whizzed by her. Striking down his clone brothers, Rex sat up horrified at the whole situation. Heck, yeah, kid. I'm okay. Right as the reinforcements break the doors, the duo are able to stun their way through the brothers, while Maul was destroying the hyperdrive to rip them out into real space before they arrived on Coruscant. Rex and Ahsoka are able to take the Hangar Command Center, hoping to leave on a shuttle, but the clones were already waiting for them. Jesse was now the commanding officer, with Commander Rex now considered a traitor. Though Ahsoka doesn't want to kill them, Rex tries to explain how his brothers see it. And those soldiers, my brothers, are willing to die and take you and me along with them. Torn in a way he could have never foreseen, tears flowing, Rex tries to see how he can save Ahsoka without having to kill dozens of his brothers. I said hold your fire, Jesse. I have the situation under control. Yeah, it'd be much like being a commander anyway. While the droids help to manipulate the hangar elevators to remove a majority of the troopers, a fight with Maul breaks out over the control of the prep shuttle. Her astromech R7 would be killed, and Rex would be hit several times while Maul slipped away. Chased down into the lower levels, it was a race against time as the Venator was being rapidly pulled towards a nearby moon. Most all of the ships are under maintenance, suffering heavy damage during the siege, but eventually they find a Y-Wing. The Venator continues to be ripped apart, separating Ahsoka from Rex, as the bomber tumbles out of the Venator's hangar. This once Jedi was able to make her way to the turret cockpit, with the help of Rex's piloting, safely making it down to the surface. The fate of the newly formed 332nd, the orange-helmeted Ahsoka troopers, who were also Rex's 501st brothers, including Jesse, were all killed in the crash. And Rex digs a grave for each of them, all made from the same DNA, raised on the same planet, all fighting for the same sense of honor for the Republic, yet also each individual struggling to find meaning in this war that was revealed to all just be a Sith's means to power. A war whose purpose was to kill the very Jedi who gave Rex and his brother their names, the Jedi who treated them as more than just organic machines. And Rex's only comfort was knowing that they were free from the endless war in their dreams. But he was now forced to answer the question so many of them had dreaded during the war. What does a clone do when the Clone Wars are over? For most, it would be replacement by stormtroopers and abandonment by the newly formed Empire. And what is indicated to have occurred is that Rex claims that Ahsoka was killed in this crash as well. That by sheer luck, he was by the Y-Wing when the hyperdrive was destroyed and they crashed into the moon. He buried them all and took the Y-Wing back to Coruscant to explain what happened. Of course, after helping Ahsoka go into hiding. And this trooper would now serve the Empire. Because what Rex says later indicates that he served for some years doing progressively more menial tasks until the clones were completely phased out in favor of stormtroopers. The next time we see him will be due to Ahsoka's involvement in the Rebel Alliance. That story will be saved for the final part of this complete life story of Rex, showing how Rex would finally choose his own fight, and how his time with the Rebellion would provide him a lot of answers to the many questions about the true purpose of the Clone Wars, ultimately leading to him fulfilling his oath to the Republic, and getting some justice for his countless clone brothers. If you don't want to miss it, be sure to subscribe and check the description for ways to support this channel for free, or check out our Patreon and PayPal. Special shout out to our supporters on Patreon, especially our $25 tier, Andrew Van, Black Phoenix, Feed Me Kittens, and Seraph Diaz. But most important of all, remember, good soldiers question orders, and the Force will be with you, always.